Aloha, and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on ThinkTech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Jill Tokura, candidate for Congress in a second congressional district representing the neighbor islands and rural Oahu. Jill has been in the state Senate and has uh, been a candidate for Lieutenant Governor, but now she's changed her race. Uh, so she can say Jill went up the hill. <laughs> Jill, welcome back to Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, please tell us uh, what's going through your head in this uh, race for Congress. Well, you know, that's an exciting time right now. In fact, right now I'm on the island of Kauai. I think the last time we spoke, I was also on Kauai. So yes. um, definitely it's been a whirlwind since we announced our candidacy for, for Congressional District 2 on Mother's Day. It was just basically a week ago. And, you know, one of the big things I did commit to was being present and listening. And so made a commitment to be on every island within the first 10 days of announcing. And yesterday we were on uh, in Kona, today we're on Kauai, Wednesday we'll be on Lanai, and in Thursday we're going to be on Maui, and next week Monday in Hilo. And so really just making our way uh, throughout Congressional District 2, which as you said is all of the neighbor islands and rural Oahu where I live, um, and really taking the time to reach out to people, listen uh, to their hopes, their concerns, and, and really how are we going to really fight hard for our families to make sure that they have a strong voice in Washington, D.C., uh, there to make sure that we can create a, a future for our kids right here in this place that we love. Yeah, uh, thanks. You, you mentioned you're out uh, listening. So what have you heard so far? And you know, what is the talk? About? You know, we've been out there um, just talking story, listening to folks for the last eight months, honestly, in communities literally from Hilo to Hanalei. And one thing that's really resonating is people want to have hope that you know their children and themselves will be able to stay here in Hawaii and not just struggle to survive and get by but to really thrive and when it comes down to it uh, the big concerns that exist in every community are the, the cost of living housing you know the, the fact that when you take a look at a starter home for young families it's over a million dollars and oftentimes um you know, someone else might come in, offer 20, 30 percent more than asking and pay cash, and they feel completely priced out of this place that they call home. You know, the fact that gas, no matter where you are in our communities, is so high that folks are having to think how often can they afford to work based on their commute and the cost of the commute. Well, that's absolutely unacceptable, given folks need to have one, if not two or three jobs to be able to keep that roof over their head and feed their families. And so we're seeing a lot of impossible choices, but I think What's so positive as well at the end of the day is that there is a, a undeniable hope that things are gonna get better and families do have a, a commitment to wanting to be here. And that's why I think it's just so important that with everything that we do, we know that it's gotta be about putting families first and families need a fighter that isn't just going to advocate on their behalf, but understand what's at stake and the urgency, you know, and our family is no different from any others as well. And so definitely, you know, as I look at our two young boys, um, I see the urgency and I feel the urgency um, that a lot of mothers and fathers feel out there right now. Yeah, um, okay, you know, you say it is uh, concern about, you know, people uh, making a living really. Uh, you got a magic wand or something or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had a magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking for that one. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but you know, uh, they say they need money, but um, they come across businesses every day. A lot of them are looking for workers. You know, they, they cannot find workers. What do you think about mm -hmm. that? You know, there's definitely a labor shortage that we're yeah. experiencing, not just in Hawaii, but across the country. Right? They're calling it the Great Resignation as a result of the pandemic. And I think what we've really got to start focusing on is how are we helping to support our children as they go through our public education system to really be able to attain those jobs of the future that are gonna give them the quality of life that they want um, to be able to live here in Hawaii and have that home and raise that family. And in many cases, I think those jobs that we're talking about for our children don't even exist right now. 
you know, but they are very viable in terms of being able to diversify our economy here in the state, knowledge-based industries, looking at, at technology, looking at data science and so many other fields. And it, it sounds like a bunch of words, but the bottom line is we know where the future is taking us in terms of, you know, innovation um, and all of these different things. And we want our kids to be first in line to get these great jobs. Hawaii is in a pivotal location given our geography um, and given our, our socioeconomic makeup and our diversity and our uniqueness. And I think we've got to make sure our education system is preparing our children to be on a pathway to take those jobs uh, and to be able to afford that kind of quality of life that we want for all of our kids. I, I noticed, um, well, my, my generation is different. You know, you have to work through high school and I, mm -hmm. and when, as soon as you graduate, you know, you, you got to work or go to school. But I see a lot of kids nowadays, they, you know, year, you know, year or two after graduating high school, they're still without a job or not even go to school, but then they, you know, they want to, they all want to get some computer related job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different, you know, like, uh, out of the, I, I think all, all type of uh, businesses, they're, they're looking for workers, you know, here, <laughs> somebody told me that even, the, you know, dishwashers, they're getting paid places over 30 bucks an hour mm -hmm. i better go wash dishes <laughs> <laughs> um so. it, it really is though it, it is about um you're absolutely right you know when you talk about the skills that are going to be necessary yeah. to take a lot of these jobs um, but the interesting thing will be if we take a look at what's been happening with the last few years as well and even before the pandemic uh, it is really about also helping to upskill and reskill a lot of workers in the workforce now to be able to take on different jobs that are also in high demand. Uh, yes, you have retail jobs and you have hospitality jobs, but there are so many jobs out there that would really be able to provide higher wages and a pathway um, to go up in a career ladder as well. But perhaps you've got to go back to school or get um, you know, some degrees or certificates to be able to really attain that. And I think it is about creating a, a, a solid P20 educational pathway from the youngest little babies to post-secondary education that makes sure that no matter where you are in life, whether you're just graduating from high school or you're maybe rethinking your career, um, you know, midway through life, that you're able to look at that on-ramp and that education as a way to better yourself and get a better job and quite frankly, add to the diversity of our economy here by being ready and skilled to step into it. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned, you know, housing, you know, uh, a lot of homeless and federal level, you get the low income housing tax credit. Uh, I, I think you called, uh, was it invisible homeless or something too? Some people call it transitional or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, is a solution or something. Yeah. There's no easy, yeah, there's no easy solution. I remember the last time you and I had a conversation yeah. about homelessness and about the state of housing, you know, here in Hawaii. And, you know, we did talk about those invisible homeless, you know, exactly right. We do the point in time count and we take a look at the number of folks that are unsheltered and homeless in our communities. But the reality is as people struggle from paycheck to paycheck or experience uh, certain types of economic impacts in their life, whether it be medical or job loss or whatnot. Uh, so many are literally just one toe away from being homeless themselves, uh, living on the good graces of friends and family that will allow them to sleep on a couch or park in front of a home. Um, and really it's about how do we help prevent them from falling into what could be, you know, a permanent state uh, of being unsheltered. And so I think there's a number of things that we've, we've really got to do. One thing I would point out though, especially at the federal level did that really I felt helped to ease some of the pressure families were facing in terms of being able to pay things like rent and food and, and you know, medicine and health bills is the child care tax credit. As you will recall last year, you know, families were able to get it in increments every month. And when I was working um, with service providers and families on helping families not get evicted and get some of that federal money for eviction prevention and utility payments, you could literally feel a lot of the pressure easing off when that child care tax credit kicked in. All of a sudden, when you had a, even a small consistent source of income coming in, 
they could pause for a bit and breathe a bit and think about, hey, should I, am I going to be able to pay a little bit more of my utility bill off this month? Can I afford to pay my rent now because I've got this additional income source? And, and so I really think that that is a huge benefit and potential relief for families that are struggling, families that could potentially be right on the brink of being homeless to those who have literally fallen just off and need a little bit of extra help to get back on track. Um, I think we've also got to look at the varying levels of where support's needed. You know, we've got to make sure we've got inventory of um, workforce housing available in our communities. I mean, we talk a lot about affordable, but the reality is when we take a look at a lot of the affordable rental projects and units out there, they're not affordable. For a lot of our families, they fall in that gap where they're not making enough to really be able to afford these units and cover all of their expenses, but they're not poor enough either to qualify for a lot of the other housing options available. So I do think we've got to look at increasing inventory of workforce housing available for our, uh, workers that are essential to the needs of our community, um, You know, whether it be in our schools, our healthcare systems, um, in government and other jobs as well. And I do think that there are programs that we've got to be more aggressive in seeking support from at the federal level in terms of providing subsidies uh, for families and assistance with things like rent, mortgage, and utilities, especially now. Lots of these supports are going to end soon. Uh, there is a cliff that comes with all of these different federal acts and, and federal supports, but the reality is we are just not out of the woods yet when it comes to our economy. I know it was a banner year for the legislature and, <laughs> and the state in terms of the money that we had. But for most families out there, the struggle is still very real. And it is about how can we know where those pain points are and work together at the federal level, the state and the county level, and with our private partners in the community to really be able to help people kind of bridge a lot of, you know, bridge this time and get to a point where we are recovering as a community, as an economy, and as, as people and families. Yeah, like you said, you know, we got uh, a lot of money this year because it's federal money. So, you know, they may not be buried, but um, we got to look down the road, you know, mm -hmm. look at the, the working class of them. So, you know, they, so they don't, you know, uh, transition into the other category that, that could need this hand, hand out. I think yeah. you got to look at programs and things, you know, how, uh, all the conditions you put on on the working class. Um, well, working families a lot, right, as we know, tend to fall into yeah. to a gap. That's why I was always very supportive of things like the earned income tax credits that really support um, families, you know, and, and individuals that are working out there but still struggling to get by. Um, we have a lot of different programs um, that support those that are very vulnerable, which we need to do. But the reality is um, there's a lot of people that are working one, two or more jobs and still really struggling to get by right now. And so what are the basics that the federal government can work with the state to be able to deploy immediate support to, whether it's food programs and feeding programs, you know, whether it's things like um, assisting with child care subsidies, as I mentioned, housing support. Uh, there's a number of different things that again, um, we can work together um, amongst county, state, and federal agencies to be able to really help our working families and workers uh, be able to, you know, to make it. Yeah. Um, recently, you were in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you met with our senators up there. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. was, it, was that when... Uh, that they were discussing role B Wade and anything to say on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I was in DC a few weeks ago to, to meet with a number of different organizations, um, you know, in terms of my run for Congress. And it just happened to be at the same time that the, um, the leaked release as to the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade came out. And, um, you know, found myself two blocks away at my hotel room at night completely angered and incensed at this violation of rights um, and walked to the steps of the Supreme Court at midnight to join hundreds of others, uh, angry, defiant, but quite frankly, inspired as well. The fact that so many from so many different walks of life felt so inclined to just come together, you know, and, and raise up arms and have voices heard at the fact that women's rights and the ability to make choices about our body 
This is a human right. It's a basic right. And I will not have it that my nieces, that our daughters and granddaughters will have less rights than what we've had. And it's a fight that's been going on literally for decades. And quite frankly, it's a, it's a stark reminder to us that the fight for rights and freedoms never ends. Yeah, yeah talking about uh, women's rights, um, uh, you mentioned uh, looking up to uh, Betsy Mink. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what she's she has done. Uh, gonna talk about what what do you think about Patsy Mink? Oh, you know, um, they broke the mold with Patsy Mink. <laughs> that that's that's the reality. And you and I were just talking about the yeah. fact that you know in June it's gonna mark the fiftieth anniversary of Title Nine which is now um, named after Patsy Mink. I mean, who would have thought it's, it's already been 50 years, but think of literally the generations, the absolute the generations of young girls who had a chance thanks to Patsy and the fact that she knew that she had to stand up uh, for her daughter, for all of our daughters, to make sure that they would not face the kind of discrimination and um, unjust treatment as she did, right? Equal rights uh, in the eyes of the law, that seems so basic, that seems so common sense right now, but what she did was absolutely revolutionary at that time. And I think it's incumbent of all of us who have walked through that door that she's opened, whether it be for sports or academics or anything, um, that we keep that door open and we fight to make sure that we keep moving forward and we break through those ceilings as well. And so, yes, absolutely. You know, Patsy has been an inspiration to me as well as so many countless others. And I remember, um, you know, she was the reason I joined the Democratic Party. You know, going out to a rally, hearing her speak and just wanting to be a part of something bigger than myself. And that's what she inspired us to do. Um, and, you know, just recently I was reading a book to my son's school, my old alma mater, Connery Elementary School, and it was about Patsy. And it was a real reminder to me as I sat there in front of my old kindergarten class that Patsy was a mom as well. She wasn't just a trailblazer and a huge fighter. She was a mom. She was a mom who struggled with guilt and balance all the time whether it was Title IX and having that, you know, survive and her daughter and needing to be there for her. And to me, that was just such a poignant moment for that realization that what made her so strong, what she really brought to the table was also the fact that she was a mother who was fighting for her daughter and for her families. And she knew exactly what they were going through because she was going through it herself. And I think that's such an important perspective that we have in our, our Congress as part of our congressional delegation for Hawaii. And, and that's one of the big reasons why I'm running for our families to put them first. Um, and because, you know, when, at the end of the day, when I look at it, our families, just like so many other families right now, just hoping that our kids will have a chance to stay here in Hawaii and, and call this their home. Yes, I, I remember her giving her uh, passionate speeches. Mm. And <laughs> it's, it's funny because recently I've seen some of uh, Maisie Hirono's, Senator Hirono's speeches. She's, Pretty passionate too, as he shows it. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think we share some of the uh, values. Um, changing, yeah. changing subjects. I think last time we spoke about agriculture, you know, mm -hmm. the state level and, you know, local and state level. Any thoughts on uh, how you take it to the federal level? Absolutely. In fact, I was just out visiting a farm in Hanalei um, and talking story out there. And, you know, I think especially when it comes to agriculture, whether it be supporting farmers or ensuring that our people have fresh food and access to food to eat, that's an important committee and jurisdiction that Congress has. And they're coming up on the Farm Bill reauthorization in 2023. And a lot of it is making sure that we fight for our farmers and the commodities that they grow here in Hawaii and make sure that's included in any reauthorization measure. Uh, support for agriculture has to come from all levels and there's a lot that the federal government can do to really enable our farmers to survive, to be able to um, you know, comply with a lot of even the federal requirements that have been coming down and resources and support that they need every single day, whether it's to deal with invasive you know, pests that they're dealing with um, or other you know, issues, natural disasters, whatnot. But farming's not easy, as you all know, Dennis. It's a, it's, it's definitely a labor of love, and we are so grateful and indebted to our farmers and our ranchers and producers for really being able to provide that food that we have on our table. 
we've got to in turn turn around and support them the best that we can. And so I do think that especially with a lot of the different um, acts of Congress coming up, reauthorizations that we do, it's about listening first and foremost to our farmers and our ranchers about what support and help they need uh, and making sure that we go out there and we fight for them in Congress and bring it home. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, agriculture is uh, uh, very dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, one item that uh, our other uh, congressman is, uh, keeps talking about is the Jones Act. You got any thoughts on that? You like controversy in your show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I, I support, I am a strong supporter of the Jones Act, you know, and I know Congressman Case has um, introduced legislation in the past to, to make amendments to the Jones Act um, and other things, but I am a strong supporter of the Jones yeah. Act um, from a national security perspective and prospecting our jobs of, of American workers. And so that might be one area where I agree to disagree um, with Congressman Case, um, but I believe at the end of the day, it is what's best for Hawaii. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, and the different level from moving to the state. Once again, you got uh, foreign affairs uh, with all the things going on. You know, being in the Congress, you'd have to deal with all of that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on what's going on around the world? You know, I think it's um, we're in a period of huge transition on so many different levels, whether, as you mentioned, it's foreign affairs, whether it's the economic affairs and stability of our own country, um, whether it's even just looking at how we deal as a country with um, civil and social unrest, discrimination, you know, acts of hate and violence. It's, it's discouraging and it's, it's heartbreaking to read the news many days and just see the kind of violence that's going on in communities around our country. And quite frankly, honestly, even right here in Hawaii. And I do think it's time for us to be able to stand up as leaders and come together uh, and make sure that we're setting the right example for our kids and that we're doing right by them as well. You know, and I think that is incumbent on Congress and DC is to set the example and walk the walk. I think that's the kind of leadership we need right now. Strong leadership that gets it, that it's not about petty differences and partisan fights. It's about helping this country get through this period of very tough transition. What we do now will make a difference for generations to come in terms of how we work through these struggles, whether it be foreign affairs or domestic. And I think that's why even more so right now, we need strong leaders that understand what families, workers, people, communities need and put that first and foremost on the agenda. Yeah, like, you know, following up on foreign affairs, in particular, we have Ukraine. Right now we basically, I guess we're doing some training, but sending a lot of money over there. Any, any other thoughts on you know, that area? You know, definitely, I think when we take a look at the situation in Ukraine, the humanitarian support that is required because at the end of the day, um, people, people are hurting as a result of this. Um, and we cannot as a nation stand by idly and allow that to happen. And so I think the humanitarian support that's going in needs to be sent there and needs to be continued as well. And I think the real key, especially for the congressional delegation for Hawaii is helping, for, helping people in Hawaii understand the connection that what happens across the globe matters here in Hawaii. And not just because the gas gets expensive or other things, uh, but the fact that you know national security, we have a role to play in it and things that happen across the globe impact us here in Hawaii. And so I think it is about all of us uh, doing our part to create stability um, in, in, you know, across the globe and in the region as well. Uh, and Hawaii has a very important role in that, and especially as the gateway to Asia. You know, um, it, this is not about China um, right now, but at the same time, Hawaii plays such a critical role in terms of security in the Asian Pacific region. Um, and I think that is a huge responsibility could also be a huge opportunity for a lot of our kids to be able to engage um, in good jobs um, and future defense of our nation right here, right here in their home. Yeah, you know, that, that's another thing, you know, defense is uh, not a big thing. And also we're, 
we're a state of immigrants over here, so um, you know, shouldn't have to ask. You know, you stand on immigration in the United States, but there's some people think a different way. But you want to no. just mention what what you think about immigration in general, the United you know, States. And you know, I think we're we're a country of immigrants, and we're definitely a state of immigrants. Um, mm. My great grandparents. Uh, landed right here in Puhi, down the road from Okinawa, you know, yeah. and my other set of grandparents uh, first, to, you know, to Hilo, then Maui, and then um, to Kailua on Oahu. So very familiar with the path many of us have taken to be a part of this great country. And in defense of that and why we came and what we've done since then, we've also got to uh, defend the rights of others who are seeking shelter and a better life here um, on our shores as well. And so I do think that again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a climate right now of a lot of division, whether it's partisan rhetoric or personal rhetoric, but we've really got to be thinking about um, what's right for our communities. And quite frankly, you know, what's at the heart and soul of our, our communities? What are we going to be known for? How are we going to set the example for our children? And when we talk about things like immigration, I think it's that's even more important that we really refocus on um, who we are as a country, what we stand for, and then not just talking it, but actually walking the walk in terms of our actions and how we treat people and others. Yeah, uh, you know, it, um, like you say, you know, we're, we're all immigrants here and we uh, grew up like that. Some of us uh, have different lives, but then, you know, most of us, you know, started in plantation lives. Mm -hmm. Or, um, but now the generation you got is the me generation. It you know, they don't care about you know where we came from, whatever. It's me, I got my my computer, <laughs> my <laughs> games, and all that. I mean, it seems mm -hmm. seems that way. I mean, so I don't know. We got you know change of thinking somehow. I think. What do you say to that? <laughs> well, you know, I think I'm not running for office, so I could say that. I know. <laughs> I think as parents, right, we we've yeah. got a responsibility yeah. to remind yeah. our kids where they came from, and the fact that we, um, you know, we're all responsible for our actions, and we all have a commitment and responsibility to our communities as well. So I think that, um, you know. You know, this is a different generation, the millennials that we're dealing with. But I also see a lot of hope um, with them as well. I see a lot of opportunity for them, um, their passion, their advocacy. Um, they care about their community. And I think it's incumbent of us to support them, but also teach them and um, remind them that they stand on the shoulders of others. And that means something. It's more than a statement. Um, it's how they got there. And um, I think that's really, really important. Getting getting back to you and and your run for Congress, um, you got uh, two sons over here. Mm -hmm. will, will it uh, be kind of hard to work in Washington D.C. with the kids over here? Do you, you plan to yeah. they they plan to stay here if you get elected or move move up there? Yeah, no. So we've had a, a long conversation with our, our sons about this before we made our decision. Yeah, yeah. And we looked at the schedule and how often mom could come home and when breaks would be. Yeah. And, you know, they they want to go to the, their schools, be with their friends. And so our two sons next year will be at King Intermediate and Castle High School, just like their mom and dad went to. Yeah. And I will fly home on weekends and be here for district breaks, uh, very similar to what we see Senator Schatz doing what uh, Congressman Takai did as well. Um, so I'll be coming back and forth um, at home. And, you know, our sons were born when I was in office. And um, one thing I'm very proud of and, and really, it really touches me through the conversations we have lately is that, that they know that whether I'm right here at home with them, whether I'm 5,000 miles away in D.C., I'll always be there for them. I'll always make sure that they are first and taken care of. And I think um, no matter where I am, no matter, you know, even right now, there's always guilt that we have as parents, that we can't do enough or be there right. as often as we'd want. Um, 
but I think that guilt makes it real and makes us relatable and like everyone else. And it reminds us what's important. And at the end of the day, my kids and my husband all know that I'm there for them. And it was a family decision and I feel really blessed with yeah, that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, one last question. <laughs> okay. should, 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 you, uh, should you be successful? Do you plan to work part-time like the present congressman or the lieutenant governor? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't fly planes <laughs> and I don't work in an ER. So, okay. um, no, no, I, you know, and definitely I think I, uh, I want to make very clear as well. I've been asked this question quite a bit that, you know, DC is a destination. It's a long-term destination. It's one that every single election, you need to earn back the trust and the faith and confidence of voters. And that's what I will do, um, but be committed to you know, really supporting the delegation and being a part of it as long as the people will have me. Um, and so that's 110, 200% okay. commitment, Dennis. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, okay, well, um, get a less two words, one sentence or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's asking a lot of a politician. Uh, <laughs> but appreciate you having me on. And as I said earlier, I'll be out in the community um, in the weeks and the months to come. But more importantly, that's my commitment I make to everyone is that you've got to be present and engaged with people to best represent them and to earn their trust. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing your viewers out there uh, in the community. And um, that, you know, it's really about them. When they look at my name on the ballot, I really hope that they don't just see my name, they see themselves. They see what we all want to fight for and this future that we want for our state and our children. So thanks. thank you thank for you. having me, Dennis. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, okay. Uh, I said this, this before, but if there's a jail, there's a way. Uh, <laughs> Mahalo to our wonderful guest, Jill Tokuda, candidate for U.S. Congress. And mahalo to the viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech free media shows, please help support this nonprofit platform. Aloha, ahoy ho, malama pono. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.